what are we? As humans, I mean, what are we really? We humans have been asking that question basically forever, and different cultures around the world at different times have found their own answers to it. Recently, there's been a new answer, that we humans are mostly bacteria. <laughs> 90 to 99 percent bacteria. And even cautious microbiologists are observing that this changes how we are able to think about ourselves. And that's interesting, because how we think about ourselves changes the assumptions that we make about what health is, what well-being is, what sickness is. It makes new actions available to us for the future. But before we look too far ahead, I've always found it illuminating to look back at different ways that we've answered this in the past. And I want to share with you two very influential ways that we've answered that question, what are we? Maybe we're like a bowl of soup, a bowl of steaming liquids with a dollop of soul on top. 200 years ago, that was more or less what we were, containers for our humors, for fluids of life in balance. They're sensitive to the bad airs around us. When they get thrown out of balance, then we get sick. For thousands of years, this was what we were. But when was the last time you worried about your phlegm being out of balance with your blood? <laughs> Has anyone here been bled, like medically, with leeches? No, because the majority of us no longer operate in a humoral paradigm. We might say that we're 70 percent water, but not that we're a homeostatic balance of blood, bile, and phlegm. Maybe. Maybe we're sealed machines, engines that burn food for energy. Our skin is like our armor, but it's vulnerable in a few chinks. Germs can get in and make us sick. Armies of invisible invaders are coming for us. <laughs> we're under siege all the time by the germs in our air, in our water, in our feces. And when our feces gets in our water, then it's war. This is the paradigm that we've been living in for about 100 years. It's where germ theory has steered medicine and public health, and it's made possible the huge leaps that we've made in life expectancy and global population. But being an individual human machine has some issues. This mechanistic war on germs has gotten us through epidemics and famines, but it's left us with a whole new set of 21st century health crises. Now, we all know this list, we've all experienced some part of it in our lives, but we have a crisis of mental ill health, of depression, anxiety, stress. We have a crisis of metabolic disorders and the caustic coexistence of hunger and obesity. We have a crisis of autoimmune disorders, the rates of diabetes to asthma are just through the roof. And unlike epidemics of centuries past, these don't kill equally. We have a crisis of massive health disparities. And it's not just in our bodies. The planet is in a climate crisis, which accelerates all of these challenges to our well-being. None of us are fully equipped to meet these crises. We can take pills and go on diets and recycle, but fundamentally, the individual isn't the most effective unit of change. Unless... Unless we change what we think we are. Unless we accept that we're not machines, and that war is not the right action, or even the right metaphor, to get us through the coming decade. Through the next century, even. So what will we do? Cling to our narrow notions of ourselves and get sicker and sicker? Or adapt our understanding of what we are? To come to see ourselves as a community of self? Now, as a futurist, I'm trained to look for where the future is just popping into existence today. And I think that the first signal that I saw of this emerging future 
was talking to Larry Smarr, director of Cal IT2 and Uber Quantified Self. Some years ago, we were talking about his regimen, and he said to me, my body is an ecosystem. And at the time, I thought it was a metaphor, a really elegant metaphor. But it wasn't. He was speaking quite literally. Later, I started learning, as I'm sure many of you who listen to Science Friday have, <laughs> about the human microbiome, about the trillions of species that inhabit every corner of our insides and outsides, that our digestion and immune function are dependent on these invisible helpers, that the microbes in our guts and on our skin influence our moods, our cravings, our behaviors that this cloud of microbes extends beyond our bodies and is shared with households, with pets, even in big rooms like this one, that we're all getting closer together right now just by breathing on each other. <laughs> the Human Microbiome Project, the American Gut Project, dozens of initiatives and thousands of scientific papers each year are building this new understanding. And the insights are very provocative, albeit couched in healthy scientific skepticism. But more and more biologists, Bonnie Basler, Jonathan Eisen, dozens more are taking to stages like this one to educate and provoke. And they're giving us a new answer to that question of what are we? So what are we really? We are our germs. More than that, we are ecosystems, communities of human and microbial cells. And that realization has the power to change our assumptions, has the power to change the future of how we help and heal. It doesn't make sense anymore to wage a war on all germs, because we're just now beginning to understand the casualties. Like many of those drawn to this topic, I understand the implications through my own experience. When I was 14, I developed a mysterious rash. And the medical response was to slather my whole body in antimicrobial creams. Within weeks, the rash was gone, only to be replaced by dry, flaking lesions that cracked and bled. I stumped dozens of dermatologists before settling with the diagnosis atopic dermatitis. <laughs> There's something wrong with your skin. <laughs> Recent research suggests that the diversity of my skin microbiota may never have recovered from that early, well-meaning treatment. There's even evidence linking it to the allergies and asthma and depression that I've experienced ever since. The point being, if we are ecosystems, we won't want to use these drugs in the same way. There's a lot of science to be done before we understand what better actions might be. Some microbiome researchers are experimenting on themselves, getting a dog, planting a garden. But we can take a leap out into this future if we approach the early science with openness and imagination. We can reimagine health through the shifts in our metaphors. Here are some big ones. Germs are bad. Becomes, helpfulness and harmfulness is purely a matter of context. A helpful bacteria in the wrong place at the wrong time can still make you sick. Medicine as war gives way to gardening and wilderness stewardship. And finally, the self as an individual gives way to the realization that a person is a complex community of organisms, human and otherwise. In my day-to-day -day work, I take this mix of culture and science to tell stories about the coming decade. On my weekends, I'm writing a novel telling a story of this future 100 years from now. Let's meet in the middle. Let's call it 35 years. That's about a generation, 
Think of the small children you know, and think about them growing up. Are you ready? The Doctor Who fans in the room will know that we just time traveled. <laughs> Welcome to 2049. And you know, time traveling always makes me hungry. So walk with me. We're going to the farmer's market. On the way, we're steered through a part of the neighborhood that I don't normally walk through. I'm wearing some invisible computer, and it keeps me from getting in a rut. When we arrive, we snack on some samples, make some purchases. You shake the farmer's hand, and we return back to the building where I live. What was once a parking lot is now a hydroponic garden. We pick the last of what we need for dinner and join families prepping meals in the community kitchen. And we add our dish to a potluck with all the neighbors. And what a spread! There are 789 species of plants, animals, and insects in this meal. You remember we would have maybe three or four species on our plate? But today, there are perennial grains growing in the edible meadows up in the hills, and mealworms raised in a shack down the street, and more varieties of fruits and vegetables than I had seen in my life before 2020. I take out a self-cooled can of live cultures, suspended in water, and mist my plate. These are my happy bugs. They keep me emotionally balanced. And what a crowd, four generations, people of all walks of life, those who could afford to live here a few decades ago and those who frankly couldn't. Most importantly, healthy people live with sick people to take care of each other physically, but also microbially. It's like a sort of reverse quarantine with the healthy influencing the sick for the better and the sick keeping their neighbors' immune systems strong. It's a bright future here in 2049. Back in the present, it seems very bright, almost utopian. But it's simply imagining the possibilities that are open to us if we embrace this paradigm shift and resolve to use it to take care of ourselves and each other. Our alternatives are fairly dire. Our losing war against antibiotic-resistant microbes, the continual shrinking diversity of our diets and really all other life on the planet, and the shame and frustration of insisting that singular individuals take the blame for their poor health when our problems demand community. Taken all together, there are some aspirations that can help get us to such a healthy and caring future. We should strive for diversity over efficiency, and that goes for everything from our skin to the variety and equality of our global food system. We should strive for integration over segregation because it's the differences between us, ethnic, cultural, in economics, in health status, that are the key to resilience in our communities. And finally, we should strive to reframe this individual notion of self, to better prepare ourselves for collective action so that we can meet these crises of the 21st century. It starts with us. Thank you. <laughs>